Hey there, and welcome back to Not Your Average Breakdown Podcast, where we bridge the gap between the news and your world. I'm Claudia, here with my co-host, your guide, the news maze, Alex. Hello, my friend. Hi, Claudia. You always have good introductions. I love that. I, I'm coming prepared, Alex. I feel like we've stepped it up and I need to come prepared. All right. I like that. I need to give you props where you deserve the props. So I'm going to give it to you, woman. I can't believe it's been a week already. I think with the holiday, mm-hmm. I think everything went by so quickly that I can't believe it's already here and we're recording again. I know. I, I don't even know where, like, where my week went. I know. Did you shop? Did you buy me something? No. Mm-hmm. That's I a little disappointing. I need to do, Alan is out of town, and I really need to stop slacking and actually do my Christmas shopping this week. I'm going to brag about something. I'm done with my Christmas shopping. Of course you are. <laughs> I got so many deals last weekend. I just banged it all out. I was very lucky. Uh, even with my kids around, I was able to get things done. So Santa's done shopping. Sam, the only Black Friday deals that I got is on my uh, nail dip powders that I use. <laughs> okay, so like you were one. shopping for yourself. Yes. I got, they were doing 70% what? sale. I got so many colors. What? Yeah. All right. So, I'll give you, I'll give you that. That's a pretty good, that's a pretty good deal. I made a mistake by not making a list of people before Black Friday, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna try to wing it this week. Yeah. So the only things I have left are just gift cards. So I'll do that at the end. And I'm sure I'll buy a lot more like little items for stocking stuffers. But other than that, this girl's done. That's mostly what I need. I need stocking stuffers because we do Christmas in New Hampshire and everybody has a huge stocking. Like it's like four feet Dude, I think, like, feel like that's cheating. Well, because it, the family's big. And so everybody buys just, you know, a few things and then you fill a stocking for everybody. I mean, it's pretty neat because you get a little bit of everything because it's so many people. Like we fill our stockings very yeah, quickly. Don't, don't tell my kids about the four foot stocking is all I'm asking. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. So what do we have on tab today? Today, uh, we are discussing the U.S. Supreme Court recently dropping a bombshell, uh, unveiling their first ever formal code of conduct for the justices. Alex, help us understand how does every other part of our government structure, all other agencies have codes of conduct, but the Supreme Court does not? Can you break this down for us, please? Oh, man, I am very glad you brought this topic up because I was livid when all these reports started coming out about the justices, which led to, you know, the code of conduct actually being implemented. But the fact that there was no formal code of conduct or code of ethics that they had to follow, like they were just policing themselves, which... This code of conduct is not much better. It's a step in the right direction, but it is far away from being a perfect guide for for the justices. Was there a reasoning from the very beginning as to why they never implemented one? That's not a a simple answer. You know, they're the highest court in in the US. They have their own judicial branch of the government. Like th- that that's them. That's the Supreme Court, you know, mm-hmm. and all the lower courts in it. They just they don't have anybody to impose these rules on them. They exist for 234 years. And this is the first time that they have something like this established. And there were some movements uh in the Congress trying to pass a couple of acts that would establish, you know, code of conduct for the justices, but it never passed because it was it was very controversial. And the Supreme Court tried to fight it for a very long time, saying that, you know, another branch of the government shouldn't impose rules on the other branch of the government. And so it was it was a mess. But because this is how it went, like they were self-policing, you know, like, oh, yeah, we will disclose everything. We will do everything that's ethical and stuff. But we know that's not how it works, not just in Supreme Court. I mean, that's pretty much everywhere. I mean, abuse of power exists. 
Oh, it, it's not like it it's not like it doesn't so i don't understand why there wasn't even a question about yes this is the highest court well even more the reason that you should be regulated i cannot agree more with you but the problem is when you have people in these positions when there is like nobody doing any type of oversight there is no checks and balances and we talked a lot about the government now it's almost becoming like a recurring team in in our podcasts i will tell you this lobbying has a lot to do with you know, their situation and why they ended up having a code of conduct. And, you know, a couple of our listeners requested that we cover lobbyism. So I think we will have to do that because I just want to go deeper into that topic. Yeah, it's definitely something that I need to learn more about because I, I don't I don't even know where to begin on that. Lobbyism is a root cause of this issue that we are seeing now with the Supreme Court. It, it really came about a few months ago when ProPublica published an article about Justice Clarence Thomas, who was receiving gifts for you know 20 plus years from Republican billionaires and conservative networks who were lobbying the government for whatever was on their agenda. And this spans, you know, over 20 plus years. And that means that Justice Clarence Thomas was not not disclosing that he was getting gifts, luxurious trips all around the world. Republican billionaire uh, Harlan Crow, he actually paid for Clarence Thomas's mom's mansion. So he paid off like her house and- Oh my God. Redid it. And he loaned him some money that Clarence Thomas ended up not paying back. So it's essentially a gift. It was for like a very expensive RV. He was constantly flying on private jets and going on these like all, you know, paid for vacations for Justice Clarence Thomas and his family. And none of that was disclosed. And then this article came out, ProPublica published it, then the New York Times published another one, and it just trickled from there. Every news outlet just, you know, kept peeling the onion and more stuff kept coming up. And so one of the main things is that not only was he getting money from, you know, these Republican donors, but he was also very heavily involved with Coke Network. And I don't know if you ever heard of them, but they are ultra conservative Republican donors. There is no better way to describe that. They are just this super secretive network. It's called the Coke, the Coke network. uh, Not like Coke, like cocaine. Not Coca-Cola. Okay. Okay. I was like, yeah, I know Coca-Cola. Okay. No, Um, the Coke network is something completely different and not associated with that. Okay. It's spelled... K-O-C-H. Okay. So I should have led with that probably. (laughs) Mostly because the other day, my first analogy when I was explaining something to you was to use drugs. (laughs) We were talking about drugs. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Right. Claudia, let me make this relatable to you. Let's talk about drugs. (laughs) Anyways, this network, they're called Coke Brothers, and they're hosting, you know, these super secretive parties and charities and uh, retreats. They do like annual retreats, and it's only men, and they make their plans and try to leverage how they can leverage their money in, in the government. And, you know... Where, the, where there is money and when there is government involved, there is always some type of litigation. Problem becomes when Justice Clarence Thomas was very heavily involved with these Republicans, ultra conservative networks who were lobbying the government to favor, you know, their agendas and make legislation that will benefit their networks and their businesses and industries. Not only that, but they also had a couple of cases that were in front of the Supreme Court. You know, they had literally cases heard where the justices of the Supreme Court were weighing in and trying to make an impartial decision. And Justice Clarence Thomas did not recuse himself as a part of conflict of interest, right? Because he's Mm. involved with these people. There's no lie about that. But he didn't disclose that. 
he was not only getting gifts, but he was uh, doing speaking engagements, fundraising for them, and none of that was disclosed. So you count 20 plus years, somebody literally influencing or having an influence over a Supreme Court justice. They bought the court. Exactly. And then when that happened with uh, Justice Clarence Thomas, then another one came out about Justice Samuel Alito, who is another conservative uh, justice on our Supreme Court, who also didn't disclose some very luxurious trips to Alaska by Republican donors. And the people were just outraged by it. But for me, it was like, yes, when I first read it, I was like, oh, my God, the sheer hypocrisy Mm -hmm. of this court and this governmental system that rich can literally buy the government and they can buy the entire regime. And to be honest, from what you're saying, it doesn't even sound like they try to hide it. Because, you know, speaking engagements and being associated with certain societies or groups, I mean, it doesn't sound like you're trying very hard to hide what you're doing here. Well, you know, I said they're they're very secretive about it. So when you go to their engagements, you have to probably sign an NDA and you don't disclose who your guests are. And, you know, but when you have secretive societies like that and secret meetings, the problem is that that draws more attention for people to leak something because then they have something to hold, you know, Mm -hmm. against you. And that's what usually happens. Like every time you, you see a bombshell article about something, it's usually either a government corruption or financial crime, right? It's usually something that companies, organizations, or government knew that they were doing wrong they tried to cover it up and then somebody became a whistleblower. Yep. And that that's really what you have here because somebody leaked this information to a news outlet. And then the news outlet started digging, started interviewing. They ProPublica interviewed more than hundred people that were close to Clarence Thomas and his wife Jeannie. And she's another controversial figure in Washington, DC. So I'll tell you a little bit about her just so you you can understand better. Not only does Justice Clarence Thomas get pretty much bought by, you know, anybody who's offering money. But his wife is a very powerful fi- figure in Washington, D.C. So she is an extreme far-right conservative lobbyist. It's a conflict of interest much. Mm. She owns a couple of businesses for profit and nonprofit who are helping Republican donors donate their money to whatever causes that they want to fight. Is it a election donation? Is it for to elect a senator to lobby a legislation to pass it or, you know, even weaken it? Because that that's what a lot of lobbyism does. They try to loosen up some of the restrictions that the government has imposed on the industry. That's why they donate money. They try to say like, oh, we talked about makeup, right? And food safety. Uh, Beauty industry is self-regulated. And that's because they lobbied very heavily saying that, hey, we don't want government involved into this. You let us do third-party certification. You know, that's why you pay for... We talked about EWG certification, clean at Sephora, uh, organic. People pay for all those certifications because a lot of them don't want to be inspected by the government. And so beauty industry is self-regulated. And Mm -hmm. a lot of industries are trying to be on that level because then the government doesn't have oversight. And Mm -hmm. when there is no oversight, you know, they can... They can manipulate the system. Absolutely. They can be in the gray zone, but nobody needs to know because nobody's checking, nobody's inspecting. And that's really, you know, well, that's one side of lobbyism. And so that's what his wife does. She is, you know, a very powerful, far right conservative lobbyist in Washington, D.C. And she also has her fair share of scandals in recent months because she was one of the biggest supporters of January 6th riots that happened in 2021. And she 
on her social media accounts, she spreads out there conspiracies, how COVID was started by Bill Gates and vaccines are going to kill us. Some very dangerous narrative out there that she's spreading. And so for January 6th, she was texting former President Donald Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, telling him that he needs to save the president and make sure that the Biden doesn't get elected because the you know Democrats are going to destroy this country or whatever you know she was saying. But then she was posting, God bless all the rioters that, that are at Capitol Hill causing chaos over there. And essentially they killed a police officer, you know, that was on duty. Yeah. And destroyed you know government property whatever but that that's who she is right she's a very chaotic person but very powerful figure in you know in our government in washington dc like she's very well known so that is his wife clarence thomas obviously ended up in hot water over here because he didn't disclose all these things and it's not the first time that it happened so people kept digging at him for years and his confirmation was actually very controversial at the time. So George H.W. Bush, he uh, nominated him for the Supreme Court in 1991. That was one of the first super controversial nomination hearings that, that we saw televised because Anita Hill uh, was a woman that came forward and said that Justice Clarence Thomas sexually assaulted her. I, I actually recall that headline. Yeah, that that was that was really huge in 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 the 1990s, and it sort of changed how the nomination process goes. And I can tell you that since then, there were some other justices that had issues, and women came forward saying that they were sexually assaulted by them. It gets very very tricky how you pick those candidates. You have to be very careful. I mean, when Donald Trump elected Justice Brett Kavanaugh. It was happening at the same time as the Me Too movement started. And it just took off. That was a hearing, you know, nomination for uh, Supreme Court justice. And it was huge. A lot of people came forward about, you know, sexual harassment because because that was happening at the time on TV. And, you know, social media, obviously, you know, 2017, 2016 was, was huge. Just hearing this kind of stuff makes my stomach hurt. I know. It, it can be a very serious topic. The deeper you dig, the more stuff you sort of find about it. So it's not just, well, oh, he didn't disclose this gift that he got one time. It's like so many things over almost like three decades of him being a Supreme Court justice. And we're talking about the people who sit at our highest court. This is really scary stuff. There's a couple of cases that are going to be heard in the upcoming years in front of the Supreme Court that are really worrying me and they're worrying the public because now that we know more than ever that our Supreme Court is not as just and unbiased Mm -hmm. and objective. People are wondering what is this going to do for the nation? Because one of those cases that is going in front of the, the Supreme Court, and they actually should issue a ruling in the upcoming weeks, hopefully, is how much oversight can a government agency have? This is why it's important. Koch brothers and other conservative networks who have been lobbying to loosen up some of the government regulations and government restrictions are actually trying to say that it is unconstitutional for certain federal agencies like Securities and Exchange Commission, FTC, EPA. There are like a couple of major government agencies. They're saying that they are overstepping what, you know, their boundaries and that they shouldn't have as much oversight on certain industries. If you give enough money to the justices, you can pretty much buy your case. You could sway your case any way you want it to go. Absolutely. So was there a particular incident recently that prompted the code, the new code, code of ethics specifically? I feel like this is an accumulation of events, but I think people were just outraged by just the way that Justice Clarence Thomas was acting and and he's he's not the outlier there right like 
all of the justices have, they all receive gifts and try to be lobbied because that's just part of their game. Because we didn't put regulations on that because we, as we said, this is the first time they have a code of conduct in 234 years court existing. So we didn't really put a lot of time and effort to restrain the court from doing certain things, right? It's the administrative side of of the court because any lower court than the Supreme Court has a code of ethics, code of conduct. They have to disclose like every single thing. They cannot take gifts more than, I don't know, like $100 or something, or maybe $500, let alone somebody to pay for your mom's house. Not only they're not acceptable or unethical, but they also have to be disclosed. And that wasn't happening. Social media changed everything. And I mean this, like, not just with the, how the government works, but if you really think the way, how do we get news? How do we do anything? The first thing that you do, you check your social media in the morning or as you're having your you know, morning coffee. That's where people were getting their information. The problem now becomes that when something gets leaked like this, if this happened in the 90s, this could blow over in a few days because people would get distracted by the next thing that was in the newspapers. But now you can't get over certain news that fast because people keep it up on their feed and people tweet about it and they make videos and they post them on all social media networks. And when that happens, that gets traction. You and I discussed privately, you know, about the Osama bin Laden letter that went viral on TikTok. That was like one video that somebody made and it just blew up and had like 10 million views. When this leaked with Justice Clarence Thomas, people were like, oh, hell no. Why are we allowing this? Mm. And people just kept getting outraged. But when people get outraged, that is a perfect time for the newsletters to keep pushing that because it's bringing clicks, it's bringing audience. They're constantly searching to see, hey, what is happening with this? Are we doing anything Mm -hmm. about that? And so I feel like there was a, a huge pressure on the court to make some type of a code that the justices have to follow and properly disclose what is happening who are they getting money from? Who are they speaking for? Who are they supporting? Because they really are not supposed to be political, even though we split them into liberals and conservatives. So currently it's six to three. You you hear that term often of the Supreme Court. Six to three means that there is six conservative mm. and three liberals. So a lot of cases that are coming up that are potentially going to give advantage to the conservatives, it's going to be more beneficial for them, right? As long as those justices are in those seats, even though they're not supposed to be political, you can still see that, you know, they have their own opinions, they lean a certain way. And then when you add to the mix money that somebody's donating, that somebody's paying, that somebody's buying and gifting and doing all these things, that's when it gets complicated. You have to disclose those things. It feels like because the court right now is more conservative, the Congress, especially the House Republicans, they don't see an issue with this. They're saying, you know, that people wouldn't be as outraged if it was a Democratic or a liberal judge, which is 100% not true. I know. I don't, but, I don't agree with that. Yeah. This situation is very problematic, to be honest. And I feel like it was a perfect storm of things. They finally had to say, like, we have to do something about this. So you're you're saying this uh, now a, a question arose while you were talking. Clarence Thomas, this has been discovered. It's been leaked. Do, what are the repercussions for him that he's done these things? That he gets to keep his seat on the Supreme Court? How How is that even possible? There are no repercussions for anybody because they didn't have any type of rules that they had to follow. Every time that it happened that somebody found a disparity or something that was wrong with his disclosure, he would just say, oh, I didn't know better. (laughs) And that's where it would end. But I have to bring something else to the mix. We talked about very loosely how this can impact some of the cases, but we cannot go 
on and not mention one of the most important cases in recent history. It's Roe v. Wade. Yep. As I was doing research for, for this episode, I saw a couple of articles bringing sort of a concern and asking if these networks and organizations or people are donating money, essentially bribing mm -hmm. the Supreme Court justices. The question is, how much did they actually contribute to have Roe v. Wade struck down? And it is very possible that it wasn't a decision that court would make if they weren't persuaded financially to do so. Such a landmark case that was undone. Yes. And not due to unbias, but due to bias. Money makes the world go around, but it is destroying our government everything that our founding fathers fought for. The government is supposed to be small and unbiased and objective and just, and it's everything but. In pretty much every case that we covered that had anything governmental involved, we always mentioned bribery and lobbyism, and you know, it's always something murky happening with them. And it's because we allowed this to happen. Also, one of the, the cases that was passed in, I think it was 2011, and that was w one of the cases that was cited that probably had a lot to do with Coke Network donating money to Clarence Thomas, because the case was Citizens United, their uh, our organization, a very loose quote, um, civil justice organization, they're, they're a little out there, wacky. But they were pretty much saying that it's unconstitutional, you know, any election donations that or a company wants to make like AT&T or Verizon or, you know, insert a big company that wants to make donation to somebody's campaign before there was a cap. OK, you can only donate X amount of dollars to this presidential candidate. Citizen United took the government to court and the Supreme Court ruled that, yes, it is unconstitutional. They essentially took away any caps on how much money you can donate to a presidential candidate, which then begs the question, well, okay, how is that okay? Because now all these powerful organizations can get involved and donate money and push their agendas because they have limitless access to money, essentially. The regulations need to be in place. The ethics needs to be in place because these are the people that need to have the highest of ethics to make these decisions. So let me ask you, now with this ethical code in place, moving forward, do you feel that this is going to change their behavior or do you think their actions are going to continue to happen and it's just going to they're they're going to find ways around it so let me tell you a little bit about this code of ethics okay i feel like this is not a solution because they need they need a better and more strict code of ethics there is no enforcement mechanism for this code of conduct so essentially they have to follow these rules, per se, that they have written down, but they're essentially policing themselves. There's no oversight. So there's still no checks and balances saying, okay, what happens if I submit something that doesn't make sense or somebody else knows that I lied about? Mm -hmm. There is nobody that's going to cross-check that. There is nobody reviewing it. And so it really just what it did is gave them some guidance on what needs to be disclosed and how to disclose it. But that's about it. There is still nobody checking them and making sure that they're not lying, that they're not being deceitful. Nobody's nobody's holding them accountable. No, absolutely not. I mean, if Clarence Thomas has been doing this for 20 years, He's not going to stop doing these things that are unethical and immoral. You, how do you put your trust in someone and allow them to keep the seat that they have and the power that they have? Yeah, that's why public trust is like at an all time low for the Supreme Court. There is just, you know, people lost trust 
in the system. We mix the government with the private industry, and that's that's where we messed up because we allowed a lot of these organizations who have access to money to pretty much tell us how government is supposed to be ran, which is supposed to be the other way around if you really think about it. The government is supposed to tell private sector how they're supposed to run. Of course, I'm not saying that the government should have strict oversight over everybody and micromanage, but the government should be able to put some rules in in order, right? And say, hey, these are the things that you should do and these are the things that you shouldn't do. But we don't do that. Our government currently is not ran that way. Private sector can put their money towards insert any cause abortion rights, LGBTQ rights, voting rights, whatever the case may be, and they can just dump all this money into it. There's nobody who's checking it. I mean, you have at least two justices on the court, right, because it was Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito, who didn't disclose, obviously, from very controversial figures themselves, Republican or Democratic, it doesn't matter if it was the other way around, I would still be outraged the same way. Why are they not disclosing that they're getting millions of dollars in gifts? Okay, so I am a a glass half full kind of gal. So we need to kind of spin this in a way where, where this conversation is, the purpose of it is to not bring anybody down, but to raise awareness of what's happening and therefore facilitate change and make our voices heard and for the right reasons and become aware of what's really happening in the world. Because if you sit there and you don't pay attention to these things, you learn about what's really happening and change needs to happen from this. Yes, I would say if this is the first time you're he- hearing about this or you maybe heard but didn't know enough information about it, I would really highly suggest that you listen to our voting rights episode because this really goes hand in hand with it. Through voting, through access exercising your constitutional right, you get to impact the change. There is no other way unless you get involved into lobbyism. But through voting, that is that one way where you can make a change. Do your research, right? Don't go out and just vote red or blue. Actually do a research on the candidates, especially when it comes to state and local, but then federal as well, because electing a president is also very important. But those state legislators that you pick, they're going to represent you in the Congress. That's very important. And those people usually tell you about the things that they're passionate about. They tell you that they are pro-choice or pro-life or they're anti-LGBTQ or pro-LGBTQ. So they all run on those important issues. And one of those issues is choosing, you know, the justices on the Supreme Court. Like presidential mm-hmm. candidates tell you in their running agenda, you can see who they will pick if there is a seat open in the Supreme Court. But the thing with the Supreme Court seats is that they're lifelong. I was going to ask you that, you know, because you I, mentioned he was he's been doing this for so long. I'm like, well, how long is a term for them? Shit. So they had, don't have a term. <laughs> I know. It's a clusterfuck. <sighs> This what is- the hell? Sign me up, sister. I mean, I could have a lifelong job security and do whatever the hell I want. And I, I'll tell you this, I would do a better job. I would make better decisions because my guilt would not allow me to sleep at night. You have to keep people's secrets. You have to keep state secrets. You have to please this one person because they might end up being an asset to you in the upcoming Mm -hmm. years or vice versa. And so it's like the term, you know, playing politics, that's what Mm -hmm. it really means. It's not Mm -hmm. about governing. It's about doing these quote unquote drug deals, as I call them, where you make these agreements through a handshake in a bar somewhere, you know, in Washington, D.C. or Crystal City or whatever, you know, they're meeting sort of off the record, make these arrangements. I was wondering why you brought this case up. I wonder what sparked this. 
Yeah, I mean, I saw that it, you know, I, I, I just read, I, I start to read headlines now, obviously, so that anything I'm interested in, I, I pitch it to you so that we can, you know, talk about it and conversate on this podcast. And so I saw that and I was like, well, that's interesting because why would they not have a code of ethics? And so I was like, this is, this is going to make for a good conversation because I don't, think that a lot of people really are privy to that information. So let's let's learn about it together, you know. And so I knew it was going to be kind of spicy, but honestly, hearing about the things that you you just brought to the table here, the receipts as as you like to call them, I love when you when you bring receipts. It's just really concerning. So it, more concerning than I thought it was going to be. You know, I thought you were going to bring up, oh, this one off, this guy might have been caught doing this and this other one might have been caught doing that. You know, this, I think this is the purpose why we're having this conversation so that other people hear it and they get mad or they want to demand change. And this is how that snowball gets rolling. I hate that some of our conversations end up like this, especially when we talk about politics, because politics are not as simple as people think. And, you know, what you read in in the news or if you just read a headline, it's like just a fraction of things that happen over there. And it is just so complicated and intermingled, intertwined. It's, you know, it's insane. I know this is very concerning. And as I said, like voting is one thing that can solve this issue, right? If you, if you're concerned, genuinely concerned how this is going, like you need to do your research on how you vote, but it's also calling for change. There are several petitions out there. There are organizations and nonprofits that you can join and you can always call your congressman. You can make your voice heard and call for change because in recent years, there was a lot of calls for change of the Supreme Court. And I feel like it's coming. It's coming now more than ever because like this is it. You you came to the end of the road because they got caught doing unethical stuff, illegal stuff. And nobody trusts them anymore. And so I feel like even though this code of conduct is not very specific in, you know, what it means for them, I feel like they, there is going to be more public oversight mm. because people now know and they want to know more. Like, okay, well, are you behaving yourself? Are you disclosing everything mm-hmm. that you're doing? And I, I feel like that also itself is going to spark the change. Oh, so yeah. it's not all it's not all so bleak, but no. it is it's definitely complicated. So there you have it, the inside scoop of the US Supreme Court's groundbreaking journey into the world of ethics. Um I hope the public continues to keep their eye on this situation because clearly the accountability needs to be put in place here. A huge shout out to all our fantastic listeners for joining us for another episode. Your support means the world to us. Um, If you have any thoughts, questions, or there's a specific topic you'd like to cover in the future, don't be shy. Definitely reach out to us. Our email is nyabpodcast at gmail.com. Alex, do you want to tell them where they can find us social media wise? It's NYAB podcast on Instagram and TikTok. We'll be back next week with another episode, ready to unravel more headlines and more make more sense of the world around us. So we'll see you next week. Thanks for coming.